Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this elephant professional live stream. With an elephant professional, she has, she has sat on the Asian Cat Development Working Group with us since the, since the beginning, advising on community and, and, and other things, uh, but also another sort of professional, Joanna McLean. Um, today we're going to drift a little away from, uh, from elephants uh, because we're, well, um, we talk a lot about elephants in Myanmar, um, and next week's lecture is about Myanmar. Um, and it didn't seem fair to continue without referring to some of the things that were going on, uh, that are going on over there, some of the terrible things that are happening to the people of Myanmar. Um, to move on and ignore it would seem like a bad thing. Uh, we can't do very much as an elephant foundation, um, especially if we can't get access. But we do happen to know Joanna, who has, a, uh, has spent many years over there, has many years of experience working with the International Red Cross, and, and has deep feelings for the people, and deep knowledge of the people of Myanmar. So, Rather than just carry on as though everything were normal, we thought we would acknowledge the people of Myanmar and come and hopefully do our own little bit to let the world know um, about how, how, how wonderful that country can be and how wonderful its people can be. Um, and hopefully some, send them some collective goodwill because it's about all we have as, a, as an elephant foundation to be able to help. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Joanna. She will tell you, give you a glimpse of her eyes and the people of Myanmar. Hi, John. Thank you, John. Okay, am I on now? So thank you very much, first of all, John, for giving me this opportunity to talk about a country and a people that I love. Uh, I did spend some time there. I was there from 2002 through to 2006, and then again in 2013. Um, my main job was to work with the Myanmar Red Cross and help them and every aspect of their programming, their relations with the government, with other organizations, uh, disaster response, healthcare, all of those kind of things. But at the same time, I really felt privileged that I could see a lot of the country, meet a lot of people and go to places that normally uh, the tourists don't go and very few people have been. So uh, I made a lot of friends, I came to love, the country, and now seeing what's happening every day on television with the peaceful protests after the military coup on the 1st of February, my heart goes out to those people who have suffered for so long under a military dictatorship and who were just beginning to move into a new era and that has been squashed again. And now it's becoming more and more violent but the people are strong. They want to continue to fight to get their elected government back. And it's not clear how this is going to continue, but I'm sure that the people are going to stay firm and stay fast. And all we can say is stay strong and stay safe. So because I had a love of that country, uh, I agreed to John with John that I would make a presentation. It's mainly my photographs and I'll do a little commentary as well, but it will give you a glimpse of the country and some of the people, their way of life and what's important to them. And these are the people who are now fighting for their survival and for their future. So I will just move on to my, uh, to my screen sh show and here it is. So Myanmar, is the largest country in Southeast Asia. I'm sitting here in Thailand and I know that Myanmar is bigger, but it's right next door to us. The Ayawadi River, which runs right up through the center of the country is a phenomenal river. And if you've heard the, heard the name of the road to Mandalay, that is actually the name of the river. It has the tail end of the Himalayas at the north of the country and in the south it has beautiful beaches. About half of the land is forested, although that, of course, is being uh, destroyed also. It has a typical tropical climate, but it has vast natural resources, jade and all kinds of um, precious jewels. It can grow anything, but sadly, a lot of what is precious in that country has been looted, I would say, by governments. It's a population of 54,000 with seven of them in Yangon, which was the capital until a new capital was built at Naypyidaw. 
It's divided, of course, into many administrative regions, and some of them are called states because they have a very particular uh, ethnic uh, minority living in those states. But it's phenomenal that there are 135 different ethnic groups and 100 plus languages. So it's a very complicated country and a very rich country. Still about 70% live in the rural areas and sadly, approximately 25% live below the poverty level. Don't have access to health services often. And the rural life expectancy is about 70, 60 years, although in the city areas, it's more like 67. But of course, beyond those facts and those hard statistics, you have a fascinating country. It's rich in history and art, beautiful people, maintaining their traditions and steeped in Buddhism. So I'm going to run through some of the key themes that I think about. And the first one would be the golden thread or the Buddhism. And I'll go quickly through the photos, just making a comment from time to time, because I just want you to get an impression of the images that I saw and captured while I was there. Of course, if you have any questions, just please let me, let me know. Precious monks. Very often the monks start at the age of seven and do only one or two weeks and then go back repeatedly during their life and some stay in the monasteries. Life and the statues often are similar. The leather hat, these are hermits. They're known by their leather hats and everything they have, they carry with them in a basket. One of the sacred places, Golden Rock. And even nuns like to have their morning cheroot. This was the littlest nun, I think she was only three years old. You hear a lot about the monks here in Thailand, but also in Myanmar, but it's also important to recognize that there are also hundreds of thousands of nuns and the nuns wear pink while the, the monks wear a dark russet red. And everywhere there's evidence of stupas and religious buildings, pagodas, statues, wherever you go, they are there and the local people care for them greatly. This is in the Chin, up the Chinwin River. I was in Myanmar during this, after the tsunami in 2004, and this village believed that they were, had been cared for because the stupa from the church was lifted by the waves and carried down to the shore, but remained intact. This is the dome of the great Shwedegon Pagoda, which is, can be seen from all over Yangon. And this particular time they were doing the scaffold, they had scaffolding and all of the men dressed in brown and cream and they were refacing it with gold. So it gets a new layer of gold every few years. Important for people to go to the, to the pagodas, to the shrines and very important in Myanmar is the day that you're born not the date so much, but the day. So I'm Sunday born, for example, so I'm a Garuda. And each time you go, you, you, you make a blessing to your, to your, um, the, the spirit of, of your, your day, of your day. Of course, equally, or perhaps more important, are the family bonds. And these are still very, very strong, often whole families living together, but very strong between the, the family, the fathers and mothers both take good care of the children and it's wonderful to see the love that is shared between the families. Another theme I picked up was just daily life. Very often my photos are in the rural areas because I was lucky enough to travel a lot in the, in the different areas of the country, working with the health programs and our, our Myanmar Red Cross colleagues 
who of course are all over the country and right now also working extremely hard to care for the wounded and those ones who have been attacked uh, during these demonstrations. So they are working everywhere in the country and they are well trained in first aid and in caring for people. But these photos, a lot of them are from the, the country areas and along the river. Still many areas, very much farming country and bullet carts, of course, are the way of transport. One of the most important ways of socializing, I would say, are what they call the tea houses. And everywhere you have these small street stalls where you can have your tea, your coffee, your, your steam bun. And that's where a lot of the discussion and politics, family life, everything is discussed. And these are everywhere in the, in the country. They're always small and short. Hanging out along the river, but of course the river, the Iowadi, the Salween, the Chinwin, and all the other tributaries are an extremely important part of the, of the country and the, all of the ways of moving also through the country. Livelihoods, the same as anywhere in the cities, of course, this, uh, today, of course, this everything that you have from banking to manufacture to to everything you would have within a city. And then also without outside there, you have all of the different manufacturing, you have local, local um, customs, you have, of course, buildings, all the things that you would normally have. It's the selling of brooms, always handy, same as here in Thailand, you cannot do without your straw broom. Um, sometimes the people are employed to um, to help don't make the roads this is time. These people look remarkably happy considering they're carrying stones and they're working often in bare feet or flip-flops to, to seal roads. The beach on the Rakhine coast, this is a beautiful beach. And at the end of the beach, there's a fishing village, which of course is important bringing in the catch at the beginning of the day, the young fishermen parading in front of the young girls who were checking out to see who would be a handy catch as well. This was a father and son that I loved watching. They walked the whole way along the beach with the father teaching the son how to throw the net, cast the net. He never once took the pipe out of his mouth, but the son was keenly watching. Then, of course, pottery important, huge water jars, and in the delta area where there is very brackish water, uh, these jars are used to store the water. After the tsunami in, in 2004, a lot of these were broken, and people, even though they were in the delta, they had no fresh water. Um, religious carvings, important part of, of everyday life, weaving, silk making, cigar manufacture, umbrellas. All these kind of things are in addition to the rural life, which is the typical animals and vegetables. <laughs> Education is important. All children and all teachers wear green and white uniforms. This was a little country school in the, in the village and uh, they were a little bit in awe of me visiting, but they were definitely interested in getting their pencils and sweeties that I had to offer alongside the, the books and the medicines for the teachers. These are typical Shan bags, which are hung at the end, and that's how they carry their school books. A recorder made from a wooden, uh, from a, from a tube, from a pipe, water pipe. Typical country school. I'm not sure what the cows down below were learning, but they seem to be definitely a part of that look. It was along the river, and they were coming out to wave. Bright-eyed children in Chentung, close to the Chinese border looking very fresh and smart in their school uniforms. Closed. Uh, it was still a clo fairly closed country, still in 2002 through to 2005. Uh, the universities had been shut because they felt that that was where a lot of dissent was being fermented. And so it just so happened that uh, I had been invited to the biology department to take photographs of 
specimens in the butterfly collection they had. And it turned out that it was also the day that these students who had studied extramurally were back at the university and received their degrees. So I, I rather illegally, because I shouldn't have been there, popped out of the car and photographed them. But I was so impressed that they had to study like now with the lockdown, so many people are having to study at home, but they definitely had studied and had earned their degrees. Very serious about it. And of course, everybody deserves a break. Everybody can enjoy a bit of quiet time, fun time with the friends. And this was a little group of kids who were playing and enjoying their life. Dominoes can find that everywhere. These were two kids in my street. A lot of the games were made up and even though I watched them, I wasn't was 100% sure what they were doing, but they were enjoying it and totally focused. And nothing better than bottle caps to play a game of drafts on a little painted table. This was in a village way down in the Delta when uh, evidently once a week, they showed a movie uh, on somebody's big TV, which was a highlight for the village. And this boy was riding his bicycle through the village with the names of the movies on the board. One of them was a horror movie evidently, and I'm not sure what the other one was. So he was doing his publicity as he ran, he cycled through the village. Very important in Myanmar is reading and everywhere you can find small libraries and a lot of these bookies and books are photocopied because it was also difficult to get books into the country. And so a lot of them were books which had been brought in by somebody and then photocopied into many, into many different uh, volumes. But wherever you were in the smallest village, you would find a little library and kids and adults alike going there. And of course, there's not a country in the world where you don't have footballers here. They're playing on the beach down in the southwest of the country. These are just some of the other people spending their time. Big time, tug of war, always fun in a village. A lot of shouting and screaming and everybody joining in. Whether it's the opening of a fair or it's a, just a, a fun thing on a Saturday. This was in my little street. Uh, it was a New Year fair and this is the boys on the greasy pole. They were trying to whack each other up with, with uh, pillows. The one who stayed on the longest got to stay and try and compete against the next player. There was a lot of shouting on this occasion. This game, I have yet to know what it was, but it was blowing rubber bands and then whoever blew it the furthest got to keep it. So I didn't see it was more complicated than that, but the seriousness with which they played it I think there probably was more to it than I knew. And just hanging out under a tree. Of course, like Thailand, it stays pretty hot and uh, you need to stay dry during the rainy season. This was after I had been traveling in the north and we had had two weeks of rain and then there was this little glimmer of light and some shining onto the cloud which made the the flooded fields of the Ayawadi look rather spectacular. And in each part of the country, there are different kinds of hats, just as there are very many different kinds of uh, pattern. So for the women, their longis, which is their sarong, they are normally flowered or uh, embroidered and stripes or particular patterns according to which state they're coming from. And the men usually have stripes or checks and of course, the hats also are different depending on the area. You notice many of them have uh, the white marks on their face. This is uh, called Tanaka and it's from, uh, in most houses, they have a, a grinding stone and a particular kind of um, branch from a tree and when it's ground it creates that 
paste. And that is put on the faces to prevent sunburn and to provide moisturizer for the skin. Uh, and also it's become somewhat of a uh, beauty design. And so often the, the women make beautiful flowers or different kinds of uh, patterns on their cheeks. Nearly all the children have it, especially the babies, sometimes completely white faces. Uh, some of the men uh, and nearly all of the women. Although today, now in the city, you would find that they might consider this to be a little bit old fashioned, but certainly many of them are still wearing that to protect their skin. This is just another shot of the, the, the vastness of the Ayawadi. This is just one little part of it. And then as far as you can see, the fields are flooded on one little canoe making its way down the river there. Of course, getting from A to B is quite an issue. You have a lot of rivers, so there's a lot of boat transportation. Uh, in the, before the Second World War, uh, Myanmar had the biggest inland uh, flotilla of ships in the world, uh, which plied up and down mainly the Iowadi River, but also the Yangon River and the Salween and the, the Chilwin and the other rivers. Uh, but because of the invasion of the Japanese, uh, the boats were mainly scuppered. So at many depths of the Ayawadi River, there are down there many of these ships. There are still a lot of boats, but smaller ones. And of course, there are now also a few uh, tourist boats which ply the river, particularly between Mandalay and Bagan, which are two of the big tourist spots. But wherever you go, there's uh, loaded buses, on rough roads, still pony carts are used in some areas. This is what is known as a tology, which is like a trolley. It's just basically an engine and, and the back, and that's the way in the country areas a lot of people move themselves and their and their their goods around. Bicycle rickshaws are used a lot. Bullet carts. This is the old style bus, which, which were everywhere in Yangon when I was there. I loved them. You climbed in the back, wooden seats. And for some reason, I don't know why, above the petrol tank on every single one, there was a sticker with a Playboy bunny. And I used to check on yes, on every single bus. These have now been phased out and they have newer buses. But in some of the tourist areas, they use these buses to take uh, tourists around and to just to highlight a different kind of transport. But when I was there, these were the standard buses in Yangon. You could never get too many people and things onto a truck. Uh, in, if you're in Yangon, it's interesting. There's what's called the Circular Railroad. So there is a railroad that runs right around the city of Yangon and it, as it leaves, it gradually picks up more and more people who are on their way to bring their produce into the markets in Yangon. So this is on the way back. And these people were, many of them were still uh, bunching their, their and, and cleaning their, their vegetables. And uh, it was very lively, everybody chatting, people reading newspapers, reading out loud, people coming through the train with food and so on. And then these people would get off and sell their goods at the market. And then they would get back on the train to go home again in the evening. Bicycles are big. When I was in Yangon, there were no motorbikes in Yangon because that was illegal. Um, now in the outer villages, you can find them, but uh, in the towns, but in Yangon, it was felt they were dangerous and they were noisy. And so they were outlawed. These are a little bit special pictures of a kind of transport that I've never seen anywhere else, but this is in Northern Chin state, which is very mountainous. Uh, and the people have this, you can see their houses just absolutely perched toes onto the mountainside and hovering above the steep mountain. And outside many of the houses were these small wooden cars, completely made of wood. And at the beginning of the day, they push them up to the top of the hill. They do what they have to do, collect wood, or they, as the man on the right here, he, he was uh, making, uh, going in every day and making and planing, cutting, planing and preparing planks 
that he was using to make his house. And he and his son every day would go up there. They would work on, in the evening, they would run down. Obviously there's no motor, but they do have a break. So uh, you can see here another load they've been up getting the firewood and the whole family's perched on top. They are, they are quite spectacular and very ingenious. And of course, we couldn't have this presentation without an elephant. And this was just along the side of the road one guy was coming home from his work with his elephant. On the river, using the old longis to sarongs to make a sail to go faster. And this is in the, in the north and this is a beautiful stupa and then one of the more traditional boats rowing facing forwards. Inlay Lake is a very famous place where you have what are called the leg rowers. They, they row with their leg. These kids are just uh, playing around in the boat, so I don't think I have any particular one. This is more remain crossing one of the parts of the delta. Everything on the dog and the umbrellas and the bicycles from one side to the other. And also up and down the Iowadi, a lot of passenger boats. And of course, like everywhere, the markets are colorful and wonderful to see all the different kinds of vegetables and fruit and everything where people can come, spend time, talk with their neighbors, find out what's going on. It's where a lot of the gossip goes on. Today, for sure, there will be a lot of discussion and there will be a lot of people who are deciding how they will react to what is going on at the moment in Myanmar. Rice and beans, of course, very important. This is up in Chengdong also, which is in close to the Chinese border. There's women coming in to buy rice and probably have brought wares in already to, to buy, uh, to sell. And traditional wicker baskets, very often they have the, the head that goes around their head to, to hold the basket onto their back typical variety of what you might want to or might not want to buy in a market. Plenty of plastic to choose from. You could see that where there were villages that had this plastic had not yet reached. The villages were clean um, because everything was done with leaves and everything was biodegradable. Um, like everywhere, plastic is easier. It's, you don't have to make it but sadly it will also be a big polluter within the country. This is more like a typical village shop. This is in Scott Market or Bojo Market in central Yangon. Some of the beautiful longis and materials that are showing different patterns but very beautiful. And you have to have the bejeweled shoes, flip-flops, not really by another name, uh, to go with them. And also everything in the market there from different kinds of jewelry, gold, uh, precious jewels, handicrafts, lacquerware, which is very important in Myanmar, religious icons, books, paintings, whatever you want, clothing, of course, food, huge market and uh, wonders to walk through on a weekend, particularly. The food is not as spicy as Thai food. Uh, it's a mixture, I would say, of obviously some spicy, there's some influence from India, there is influence from Thailand. And of course, everywhere you go, it's a lot of food eating, eaten in the street. So a lot of street stalls, people taking the food around. You can stop anywhere and have a meal, fruit, little stalls on the side of the road. Um, this was not so much food as betel nut because a lot of people chew betel, uh, which stains their teeth rather red. Um, and this one was just sandwiches, ice cream, whatever. You can pick it up. See, he makes 
he carries it on his shoulders and then when he needs to, he sets it down and throws down a few little stools and there you are, he has a little street store where you can eat. A bit more fashionable one with plenty of rice and noodles and uh, some savory topping for that. The culture and tradition is so vitally important and each state and within each state and region, you have many different um, cultural groups and they are often very easily identifiable by the costumes they wear. These are girls from Chin State. Um, it's rather interesting, they wear a kind of tartan and Chin State was one of the areas on the outskirts where the missionaries were very busy and obviously brought with them some rather more European style clothing. And this has gone on and become part now of the Chin costume. You also have many other groups like the Lisu and Lahu and Aka, uh, the Wa. So, and within those, there are many subgroups as well. And even today in the rural areas, the people wear their, their clothes, their costume, not just for special occasions, but every day. And sometimes it's rather amazing to see um, a kid with a, with a traditional cap, bejeweled cap, and then a, a t-shirt with some crazy slogan on it or Versace. It's a real mix of, of the old and the new. With some beautiful embroidery on some of the clothing. This is a village that you can only get to by walking or if you're lucky by motorbike um, up in the northern Shan state. Um, and this was a very old lady with very bad cataracts also and she was looking after her little few little pigs. But you'll see that in this village it was really very clean because plastic hadn't yet got there. So it was scrupulously clean and everybody had their own house and everybody looked after everybody else. And this is one of the villages where we were looking to, we asked, what, what would you want most if you could have some support? And what they wanted most was a small generator so that they could have electricity in their village. And they provided a lot of the money, which was something like 2000 US dollars to buy a generator. And they then prepared all of the lines and where, which would bring, and each household was responsible for buying their own light bulbs. And little by little, that village got electricity. This is up in, also in, in northern, in the north. Um, I was lucky enough to have an opportunity to go to what's called the Naga New Year Festival. The Naga people span across India uh, in the north of India, that's where the, most of them are, but there are also 50,000 uh, Naga um, people living in Myanmar, and every year they have uh, a festival, and at that festival they come, and they come from maybe two, three days, four days, five days walk away, and they have a series of um, festivals and events to commemorate their lifestyle and also to look forward to the new year. So these are some of the Naga men looking splendid in their, with their uh, costumes, tusks, boar's teeth, tiger's teeth, claws, many things. It's, they look spectacular. One of the girls. Most of the women have uh, a little tattoo on their chin and on their forehead for this particular region. And then some of the men are also completely tattooed. And like everywhere at this festival, the girls were looking to bedeck themselves in wonderful jewelry to attract attention, I'm sure.
many of you, even if you don't know much about Myanmar, will know about the most famous places, which would of course be Yangon, Mandalay, Bagan, Inlay Lake. They're the places that people mostly go to. So, and of course, the most fabulous and um, sacred, the Shwedegon Pagoda, rising above the city of Yangon. Also in Yangon. The palace in Mandalay was completely destroyed, um, but there's a part of it which has been reconstructed, and this is one of the corners within inside the moat in Mandalay City. And Sagain, just a series of temples. Very famous longest teak bridge in the world called the Ubain Bridge. It's more than a kilometer long. And every day there are people walking across it and going from side to side because they had to, but also because it's something pleasurable and every so often there are little seating areas so people sit and chat there. And it's forbidden to ride your bicycle, so you have to push it. Up in Rakhine State, there's a place called um, Mraug U, which is also a very famous but less known uh, than Bagan, um, but a series of, of very interesting uh, tunnels and monuments and inside the tunnel, there are hundreds of Buddha figures. This is at Inlay Lake, the famous Inlay Lake where the, they grow food uh, on the lake on um, beds which have been made from moss and, and then earth on top. And then this is a fisherman sitting at the moment, not paddling, but with his net, which he puts down onto the floor of the lake. It's not deep and catches fish and then spears them with a with a spear through the net. And then coming to the, maybe the most famous of all is Bagan, ancient Bagan with thousands of pagodas across the plain. Some of them are still extremely well kept and being restored and others are just left to ruin, but they're still absolutely beautiful to wander and, and visit. This is from above with the Ayawadi in the background and one of the more famous of the temples on the plain. And if you're lucky enough as I was with my sister and brother and who when they visited, we went up in the balloons over Bagan and we saw for ourselves the beauty of that huge plain with the pagodas and temples dotted across it. And lastly, I'll finish with a few faces people of Myanmar, these are the people who were now struggling for their future. After I had been there, I felt so strongly about it that I felt I wanted to write about it. It was a bit cathartic for me. Uh, so I wrote uh, a book called Two Eggs and a Lemon and I will read a little, read a few uh, paragraphs from that as to why it's called Two Eggs and a Lemon. These were kids on my street uh, and it's a series of stories about different aspects of me and my life and the things that I did while I was there and the people I met. Uh, so it covers everything from religion to, to health, to uh, games, to why people are called what they're called and so on. So this is my book called Two Eggs and the Lemon. And then I also did using some of my photographs. Uh, I prepared a photographic book, uh, which is a celebration of work, play and prayer. And there are photos from my time there and also some subsequent visits because I try to go every year to see my friends there. Sadly, I haven't been for a year because of COVID and now because of this severely um, difficult political situation. So Myanmar is today in crisis, this is for sure. And I think that all the people are thinking as this young boy, what 
is happening to my country. And what I want is to live a happy life and a secure life. And that this life should be with the legally elected government restored. So the people are fighting. You will have seen it on your television screens. It's escalating. The people are protesting, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people throughout the country in Yangon and Mandalay and the other big cities and even in the smaller villages. They are peacefully protesting. However, the military and the police are cracking down and using live ammunition and they are getting more and more ruthless in going into neighborhoods, shooting into houses sometimes. There are more than 200 deaths already, and there are more than 2,000 political prisoners. None of us know what can happen, but all I can say is that to the people of Myanmar, we are thinking of you and we are with you. Stay strong, but stay safe. As a final note, uh, I would like to to leave you with this small excerpt from my, my book. And it's as relevant today as it was then. It was after the, it's in a chapter called Weekend Wanderings when I talk about going through the village, going through the township you near know, where I am, talking to the neighbors, just wandering about and using my camera and Often I used to take pictures of people, locals, you know, I'd go home and download them and then share them. So it's after the fair we had had in our street and I read, a few days after the fair, I download my photos onto my computer, choosing the best ones of my neighbors. I print them and head back out into the street. I stop by to give a set of photos to a family, fun ones of the children and a lovely one of three generations, grandmother, mother, and daughter in front of their small stall, selling basic necessities, rice, oil, sugar, onions, and dried fish. They offer me a cup of tea, but I decline, indicating that I have to visit other homes. They nod and smile their thanks for the photos. Later, returning home past their store in the last rays of the evening sun, I hear hurried feet behind me, Thinking it's one of the younger children coming to take my hand to walk with me, I turn and wait. It's a little boy from the store, already dressed in his yellow pajamas and clutching something carefully in both hands. Reaching me, he looks up with big brown eyes, a solemn smile lighting his face, then slowly opens and holds out his hands, offering their gift, two eggs and a lemon. They rest heavy in my hands, the eggs smooth and a little warm, the lemon's knobbly skin releasing its fresh tang. I think of all the weighty reports about Myanmar, a country and people vilified for the poverty, ethnic conflicts, the inadequate health services for the people, the decaying infrastructure, the pervasive presence of the military and the fear. Yet in my hands, I hold the evidence of another reality. And I wonder, why is it that those who apparently have the least offer the most? Thank you. And if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to, to ask. And I will do my best to, to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. Um, uh, there are, aren't actually, well, hold on, now you've done it, okay. There, there aren't actually a, a, any questions on the Facebook. Um, I think uh, what you have, I, I, what you've wonderfully shown is, is as I say, as we were talking, the, the, how peaceful the country can be and how, how, I mean, I guess every country's people are wonderful, but it's, um, <laughs> how human, how human and how, undeserving of, of what's going on in Myanmar is and what and, and almost of their of the depth of their past as well. Um so thank you very much from that. Obviously it was um, to me uh, very to very you 
very emotional for you to, to, to relive those memories. And I have comparatively few, me and my friends, but I know how I feel for them and you, you with your such a such a heart in the country. Um, I, I can only imagine what, what you are going through. Um, uh, and I've said it before, I mean, I'm, I don't want to get particularly political, but I, I, I think it's time, hopefully, we can add this. It's, it's time that somebody said somebody did more than issue an appall an appalled statement because um, there needs to be some action. And what's going on there is terrible, and the people doing it don't much worry about statements of how appalled some people might be. So let's hope. Um, I I like you, and I'm not an expert anywhere near you. Or I can't see can't see how anything is going to go. Um, a lot of the comments coming through are not questions. Um, Bob and Sheila, who I know, Sheila, who I who's <laughs> who I've known all my life and um, has taught tight connections to me and Mar or Burma as well, is was weeping and watching it. So I think um, yes, everybody um not many questions, everybody joins us in that and thanks you very much for, for, for reliving those memories for us and um, hopefully in our small way we can do we can do a little bit of good to add to the weight of letting the world know about what's going on there and, and hopefully we can we can change. Um, I, I don't think I'm going to do my usual sign off and everything else, but just to stay strong and stay, stay safe to the people of Myanmar to echo your thoughts. And for those of you who are watching the live show, I will mention it once the elephants on in the back. So that's, that's, I know there are some people worried about that. It seems a small thing to worry about, but it is, it is there. It's a little bit away for some other people's minds. So thank you once again, Joanna. Um, here's, here's some. I'm literally looking at a very peaceful corner. Thank you, Joanna. Um, and uh, yes, we will we will call it quits. And as I say, next week we'll be back in Myanmar talking about Myanmar elephants and research that went on in happier times over there. But I didn't think we could continue to talk about the country itself without touching on the subject. So, and you've done it so powerfully. Um, any any last words? Uh, no, I just because bringing it back to the elephants, I'm also concerned about the elephants and what you're doing with them. You know, I've been following the live streams. So I, I want to, to give you um, a couple of dozen of my books, uh, of oh, thank you very much. Uh, which you can sell in the shop and all proceeds go to help the elephants and what you're oh, doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's, that's wonderful. You can get uh, either a, a hard copy or a soft copy of the uh, elephant, uh, of the elephant, of the uh, <laughs> portraits of Myanmar uh, or of two eggs and a lemon. So I will hopefully I'll bring them up myself so I can oh, please do. Yes, sometime. Uh, come and visit you again and bring with you um, a load of books which you can have in your shop and share and use the money for your elephant work. Thank you very much. And, I look forward to and, and also to the live stream audience. As well. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. That's, that's very, very generous. Okay. You're welcome. Yes. Stay strong and stay safe, our, me and my friends. I hope you can watch this. Um, if you can't watch this live, I hope it gets through to you somewhere. And, uh, you know we're thinking of Oh, hold on a second, I've got to... <laughs>